Welcome, fellow anglers, to the Working Class Fishing Podcast, a place for all anglers, amateur or expert, to share their stories and learn about fishing. Join your hosts, John and Brian, each episode as they debunk the perceived inaccessibility to fishing, break down the barriers of any and all angling methods, and hear stories from other anglers and their own journeys with fishing. Now, let's get this show started. Welcome back to another episode of the Working Class Fishing Podcast. I'm your one and only host tonight, Brian. John is spending the evening with Mr. Raiden, the Morris Jr. It is his birthday today. So make sure when you hear this, you shoot Raiden over a happy birthday, even though it's going to be a lot later than that. So John's out. So here's our sponsors for you tonight. We have Anatomist Fly Company, CD Fishing USA, Mr. Sure Cure, Not a Tackle. Angry Rooster Fly Company, 317 Flies, and Lid Rig. Make sure that you go check out all of our sponsors and let them know that we sent you. So tonight, my very special guest has been a longtime friend of the podcast, and we've always uh, stayed in touch and did all that. I got Martin here. You might know him better as Sageheart Tenkara on Instagram. Martin lives in Northern California, and he loves to Tenkara fish, and he does a lot of really cool stuff with Tenkara. He's the ties flies gets out after the fish, everything else. And so we're welcoming, welcoming another Tenkara angler tonight. So Martin, thanks so much for being on. We're really excited to have you. Oh man, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this has been a long time in the coming because I think we were bouncing back and forth and you, you'll always give us really good, honest feedback on episodes. You're like, hey, that was a good episode. You know, and that, that person sounded really excited and stuff. So it, it's our pleasure, you know, at to have on the podcast and talk about your fishery specifically. I, I consider you to be a part of the PNW being in Northern California because we share a lot of the same species. We share a lot of the different um, same waters, same river types, uh, the, the ocean environment and all that. So yeah, it's super exciting. Yeah. Um, man, I'm honored to be on here. Um, I, I, <laughs> It's funny you bring it up. I was just thinking I'm almost caught up. There's a like an episode or two that I haven't listened to yet, but you guys have some great guests and I think you can tell when people are passionate about what they do just by, you know, listening to them, having a conversation with you guys and just what they say and the excitement that they say it with. So, yeah, you know, it it, it all depends, you know, I mean, there's some folks like fishing's fishing for me uh it, it's it's a way to release and and do all yeah. that kind of stuff and, and much in the same way for yourself uh, you know the, and then there's some folks i mean it's a very serious business and um you know i think we all share the same commonality it's fun no matter how we fish and and how we go about it and you being a, a tankara angler uh you know i know i know a lot of the western fly guys guys give tankara guys the heat i look at it as like that's just another way to go out and have fun. Yeah. And I mean, really that's, I think that's the most important thing in fishing. I really feel like there's, an, you know, rules that you have to follow. Um, uh-oh. And um, I mean, that's fine. We kind of, I like to joke about them too, but, you know, I respect what they do for sure. And, you know, a lot of people like to go after bigger fish try to catch trophies whatever that's fine you do you i'm happy with just a little like six seven inch trout so <laughs> yeah i it doesn't matter that yeah. I, i'm glad you said that because it's like if the rod end is dancing it, 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 it's a good day because and, and that doesn't even necessarily matter right you know you could be out yeah. there on the river and you're walking around and you see a herd of elk or you see the bald eagles you know fighting getting ready for breeding season or you see a couple deer and they're just like sipping water or whatever else. But when you get the end of that rod dance and it's like, Hey, you know what? Yeah. I, I, I don't <laughs> suck at fishing. I actually got something. And I would totally agree. I mean, like the scenery is just amazing. Some of the places that fishing can take you is like, I've been to places that I probably never would have even looked at on a map. If, if I wasn't going to look for fish. Well, that that's the whole thing. It's like, uh, do, do you use Google Earth or Onyx to scout where you're fishing? Um, mostly uh, Gaia. Oh, okay. 
Um, but sometimes I do have some, um, you know, USGS, like the physical maps, the paper. Um, sometimes guy doesn't show everything. So if I, sometimes I'll like see something when I'm out and about and I'll mark it. And then I'll look at my USGS map just to kind of see if there's something that's not showing up on Gaia, but there are some uh, some pretty good overlays with Gaia as well. The, you know, I've heard of like all these different mapping uh, softwares. I've never tried Gaia before, but I definitely want to try that. And I think that's something for us in the West that, mm -hmm. that is really important, not only to establish like, okay, this is national forest, this is BLM, this is state property, this is county property. Okay, this is private property. So, yeah. you know, can, can I go there or not? You know, because this looks really fishy, but this is like some dude's backyard. Um, I I, I want to check that out. I definitely have to check that out for sure. It's a good program. And I mean, um, it's uh, right now I have um, like snow overlays, which is cool. Um, in the summer, though, last year, I think it was, they added even like a wildfire overlays, which, oh, wow. you know, out west is a... <laughs> yeah. unfortunate uh reality <laughs> yeah I, you know uh, people talk about like oh it must be so nice to live in the west because you don't get hurricanes and you don't get tornadoes and you don't get nor'easters it's like well but we get wildfires and we have volcanoes and we have earthquakes and so yeah, yeah wildfires are obviously the most prevalent and they're pretty much guaranteed every year especially you, you've had the atmospheric river. We'll talk about that a little bit, and, and oh, you yeah. know, as, as to how that's going to change your fishing, because we all know that, that water equals fish, but um, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's, it's a mixed blessing because I think they, they estimated some kind of like three gazillion gallons. I, it, it was some massive number of uh, amount of water in gallons that they said had hit specifically your area, your region, and uh, yeah. it really turned things around. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I don't think it was enough to pull us out of the drought we're in, but uh, man, it was crazy. I mean, I, oh, shoot, what was it? I think um, I think on January 19th, there was something that was like 15 out of the past 19 days that had snowed up in Lake Tahoe. Ooh, that's um, a lot of snow. Yeah, and they got a lot. It's crazy, even you know, driving around, we got a little bit of snow where we're at and we're not nearly at that elevation, but, um, man, the, the rivers were just blown out. Um, some of the lakes were spilling over cause we got so much, you know, so much rain and so much water. Um, fishing has definitely been a little different. <laughs> I'm not much of a winter, uh, fisherman, but I'm out there just, you know, kind of playing around, seeing if I can find something and, it hasn't been very productive. <laughs> it, you know, water's a mixed blessing, right? Because yeah. we need water for, you know, to drink, obviously, yeah. and, and for irrigation. And, and we need a decent snowpack to keep our streams rolling along. But you're talking about the blowouts. Blowouts, I, I've heard a lot of people from the East Coast like, oh, well, when the water gets high, the fish get more active and they get like next to the banks and they're trying to, you know, hit this and that and everything mm -hmm. else. And I, I said, what's your discharge? I've asked that. Like, what, what were your rivers discharging at? Oh, man. Um, I couldn't say. I know there was one that generally runs around 700 CFS. Um, it's a big tailwater. Um, but I don't recall when it, what it went up to during that. But it was, I want to say, at least triple. So you're, you're talking about three to 4,000 CFS and, and something so. that's basically nothing. <laughs> yeah. I don't quite know if that's right, but, um, even our little stream, I think I want to say runs at like around two or 300. And I think that was running at about, uh, I think 1200 during the storms. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, I think that, uh, to give context, um, if John was here, he, he would be able to talk about like his, his fisheries. He's like, mm -hmm. man, it's really pumping at 500 CFS. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, Western rivers, obviously. Right. I mean, right now river, the, the rivers were fishing, uh, up here. And obviously we're, we're more accustomed to more water, uh, mm -hmm. further North from where yeah. you're at. It's just the way that the weather patterns roll, but 
our rivers are running about 3,500 CFS. Mm -hmm. And that's like, uh, uh, you know, yeah. that, that's okay. <laughs> it's not getting the fish moving. We need like, um, we need four to 6,000. That's the magic number on our big mm -hmm. river, rivers to fish. So a lot of people are like, that's just mind blowing, but you have big rivers in your area too. You know, you yeah, have the Klamath, you have the Trinity, uh, and they really pump. They pump some serious volume. I mean, you guys do too, though. I, you know, when we were up there last year, um, uh, drawing a blank, Rogue River was raging. I mean, you know, by like our standards. Um, yeah. I've been to Columbia and that, that's a crazy ass river. That thing's huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i think i i i probably overstate the columbia a lot and you've obviously you've listened to this and i always talk about like oh you know today the columbia is pumping at a half million cfs and people are like oh whoa you know what's going on there but you you have a better understanding of yeah. like the size of the river of course it's going to pump because it's three miles wide you know yeah. <laughs> it, 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 that's just what that river does like the, you fish the middle fork of the Willamette, which is way, way up from where I'm at, but uh, a, a fantastic trout fishery. There, there's bass up in there, but it also uh, has very good habitat for salmon and steelhead too. Mm -hmm. um, up there, it could be discharging at 12,000 CFS. And that yeah. could be just like prime conditions. River width plays a big role in that. But yeah. like I said, you have the Trinity, you have the Klamath River. Klamath River is going to have some incredible things happening soon. We can talk mm -hmm. about that. But before all that big, you know, atmospheric river <laughs> and everything else that everybody across the United States read about was happening, what what was your last fishing trip? Oh, man. Um, you know, actually, the last one that comes to mind was right at the start of the atmospheric river. Um, I went out and so I'm you know, I'm not very like well versed in nymphing with the Tenkara rod, um, or any rod really for that matter, but trying to learn. And so that was kind of my thing this winter is just like, um, you know, I'm going to play around with it, try to see if I can get better at it because just make myself a better angler. Um, so I went out and the flows were definitely high, probably even higher than they usually are in the springtime. Um, but I've, kind of started from the top with just whatever I had on, which wasn't weighted at all, seeing if I could get anything to come up out of like some spots that I know were more shallow. Uh, nothing, which wasn't surprising, switched to something with a little bit more weight and just kept adding weight until I could hit the, you know, until I could get that um, line to slow down a bit. And got a couple little bumps in some spots, um, but then there's one little brown that I posted about just this, last week that um that took the took the fly and I was super surprised and I think it was just kind of a um it sticks in my mind because it was kind of a culmination of like all this learning and figuring it out and losing flies yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah it was exciting um but since then yeah it hasn't been too too popping yeah, well, <laughs> well, you're you're going down the right path for what we do, and winter mm -hmm. nymphing is where it's at, uh, mm -hmm. especially you know trout winter nymphing, um, nymphing uh, yeah. is really <laughs> one of those things that's like, you know, uh, that's that's where we focus. And I know that there's some folks out there that are really able to like at, at five thirty three p.m. There's going to be a hatch, and it's going to be a BWO, and they'll be out for fifteen minutes. So they're going to be size 20 and we need to go throw those. And that's what we're going to hook up on. Right. And, yeah. and <laughs> that's great. But I know that the other 99.999% of the day, we put something down in the water column and we fish it really slow. It, it, it's going to catch the trout during the, mm -hmm. but you can't do that when the water's all muddy and churning and blown out and, and yeah. you know, running, you know, a, a little tiny Creek at 3000 CFS, a big river at, you know, 90,000 CFS or whatever. Uh, so you've definitely been shut down on the fishing pretty yeah. hard. Um, and, you know, kind of before that, one of the other things that kind of really turned me on to the nymphing was using the K-Roo rod. Um, as the weather was getting colder, 
um, I want to say like November-ish, I had gone out with it to one of our bigger rivers in the area. And I'd taken both the Tenkara and the Keru rod and fished with the Tenkara on the way up and then the Keru on the way back down to the car. And um, yeah, just like, that's still fairly new to me. And in the past, I'd used one rig setup that wasn't really cutting it. So um, when I was out there, I was kind of brainstorming and ended up doing a dropper rig. And that was, that was the ticket. I caught a couple in probably just 10 minutes or so. And the second of those was actually, I think my personal best, just all the way around. So, and that's great. The droppers work freaking awesome especially in the colder water the finesse style fishing all that mm -hmm. stuff for for the listeners that uh, fish bass uh, the dropper rig is not too far off from the the drop shot uh but but it's fished on a fly rod and and so it basically put your weight on the bottom suspend your bait up top that's that's what he's talking about but for we've had other guests on here uh amanda uh and and a few others that have talked about tankara mm -hmm. but we you, you threw a really good thing. You, we have Tenkara and Keiru. For our listeners that, that have not listened before, especially folks that, that, that know you that maybe don't know about that, what is the, the, the difference between Keiru and Tenkara? Um, so from my understanding, I mean, Tenkara is meant to throw light, unweighted flies. Um, while the Keiru is designed to throw weighted systems, whether it's your flies, adding on drop shots, split shots, any of that. Um, and it's designed to fish deeper water in a way, allow for better hook sets when fishing deeper, how about that? Um, another big difference too is when you're using all the weighted tackle, you don't have to use a casting line, like a 10 car line or um, any of that. You can just use a, uh, what did I buy? I just bought some, uh, fluorocarbon just like a line you'd put on a spinning rig okay and um you know equivalent to uh i think it's equivalent to 4x is what i bought okay and then i tie in some 5x tippet and then down at the bottom where i tie my weights in i actually have some six it uh yeah 6x so i can break that off if it gets snagged somewhere and not lose yeah. my entire rig <laughs> yeah well and, and that's an important thing to take note of is that um, in any fishing method, especially for folks that are new to it, um, mm -hmm. going with the lighter weight leader, the weight is always what hangs up. It's not always necessary the hook necessarily the hooks. It's it's mm -hmm. going to be the weight because the weight's down in the bottom. It's down. It, you you have the weight below where the fish zone is, which is mm -hmm. slightly suspended up into this middle water column. Depending on the time of year, we have the temperature inversion in the winter. So. Mm -hmm. Even in rivers, we have that temperature inversion. Fish are going to pin down. They kind of huddle up. They're like, ooh, it's cold, you know, yeah. <laughs> and they're and they're kind of living in their zone. And then, you know, we come through with something and we're, tr we're trying to put it where it's like, I don't want to get out of my warm bed, but man, that donut looks good. And then we kind of, they, you know, you're trying to get them to duck out from behind that rock where they're nice and cozy to say, oh, I'm going to have a donut for breakfast. Bang, you know. Yeah but that weight is down in the bottom. They're not, they're not moving through the water column. Like, Hey, I'm jazzed. You know, the water's 55 degrees and I'm just popping, you know, which yeah. is our magic. That's like the magic number for trout, you know, from what I understand, I, I think there's, you know, 65, you, you could get a little warmer, but after that it's like, meh, you know, yeah. Um, anything below that is like, it's too cold to come out and play, but no, that that's an important difference. So in, in conventional fishing, that's the difference between, dry fly and nymphing mm -hmm. and really really at the heart of it and and when you're talking about keru and drop shot we're really starting to edge more into that euro style you know yeah the, the fish quick deep deep slow travel progression of that mm. and one thing that's cool too so i don't use an indicator with them or anything like that per se um i do have some fluorescent yarn that i use as markers which is kind of a traditional setup where you tie on several different colors. And then what you're kind of doing is, um, the way I've approached it is finding the amount of weight I need first to get that fly down and kind of feeling when I start hitting the bottom. And then I start adjusting my, um, my yarn markers and they're not sitting on the water, per you know, like 
it's not like a floating indicator or a bobber um but they help to kind of mark where you should be drifting and then having multiple also helps so like if you know the pool drops off in a certain section you can let that first one dip underwater and then go up to your second marker yeah I, then, I, no go ahead with, uh sorry yeah the um with the cable rods being carbon or graphite all the way through they're super sensitive so you can feel those little strikes and stuff even if they're pretty small i mean it's very apparent when a fish hits it versus like when your weights bounce off a rock mm -hmm. so yeah i notice a lot of people when they nymph you know that with the anchor fly uh euro nymphing or whatever every time they hit a bump they jerk you know mm -hmm. and, or, or they strip set because they feel that bump until you learn what you're telegraphing the river with that anchor yeah. You know, whether that be split shot or, or, you know, like an anchor fly, some type of jig fly that's down there. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, when a fish grabs, because it's especially a trout and you can talk, you can, you know, elaborate more on this. It, it's more of that chomp, 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 you know, because yeah. they're, 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 they're stunning and grabbing the bait. Uh, is that, is that your experience with, uh, yeah. when you're, you're going along, you go, dunk, 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 and then you get the, dun, 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 you know, that machine gun and you know, mm -hmm. that's, Definitely. And I think also too, like using the, um, the dropper rig, it's, I kind of liken it to, a, um, like a guitar string. There's tension in that line and you want to keep that tension. And once you feel, you know, you can feel when the tension kind of gives because your weights hit the rocks at the bottom, but there's, yeah, kind of that machine, that, um, the bouncing or like, um, if somebody were to pluck the guitar string, there's a different vibration that you feel. Mm -hmm. and then just like uh i try not to lift upwards i definitely am of the mindset that it's better to go downstream on your hook set um partially so if it was a fish you don't just pull it away from the fish <laughs> yeah but uh, ha have you ever watched a fish chase your stuff like in a run like it'll go past it and then it, it kind of backs up and then it's like oh i really want that and it goes after it not with the Kru, um, just because it has been definitely like a deeper pool that I've used it in. And then the rod I have too is 18 feet, so it's a little further out there. But with 10 car rods, I have definitely seen them kind of like check out a fly, go away, come back. And um, we actually have a, several years ago, we went out to the Eastern Sierras, my wife and I, and there was one uh, river we were fishing and she was getting super frustrated because she found a spot where there were two or three brown trout holding and she would drift it and every time they'd come up and look like look right at it and look like they're going to go for it and she'd get excited and then they'd turn away and go back down into the pool <laughs> so just hear her cussing in the background just yelling at these fish yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're incredibly like uh, it's amazing to me uh fish that are heavily pressured it seems mm -hmm. like yeah uh, they they tend to do that like um you know you're talking about the eastern sierras which i i know that there's probably quite a few folks that go and fish that area um those fish aren't as reckless as ones where you know you might be out kind of in the remote desert and you find a stream and you have a, a good stock of like wild rainbows in there to go after yeah. brown trout are funny like that i i know that there's a lot of people like in michigan and pennsylvania they they just go out and smoke brown trout like crazy and they're like i don't know what your guys's problem is but <laughs> you know it i i've noticed that even with rainbows here cutthroat you'll mm -hmm. see them you'll see them you're like oh it's coming up and then it just kind of like does this and it just yeah. sinks back down <laughs> and, oh come on man let's play and you can float it by them several times and they'll do it every time but they'll never take the fly yeah and that's where people start doing the weird wine shy thing and all that yeah but no it's fun um i definitely want to spend more time with the keru rod especially um i mean it, we're in our coldest month now but as things start to warm up i'll probably start taking that out a little bit more until probably like late april when the dry fly mm -hmm. action kind of really takes off then i'll probably just go back to my 10 car rod so when does your fishing really pick up there? Um, usually, usually the last few weeks of April is kind of like the earliest. Um, most of our stuff we're able to fish all year round here. You just can't 
take anything between like mid November and the last Saturday in April. Um, I don't think we have too many special regulation waters in the area, but yeah, I would say last weekend of April, it's usually pretty good. Okay. And then probably up until, I guess, October and November, really kind of depending on weather. Yeah, that, that sounds familiar, you know, similar to what we have here, you know, usually mm -hmm. depends on the body of water. We do have year round, like still water fisheries, lakes and reservoirs that get stocked yeah. all the time and all that. But most of our streams are, um, they, they either kick off in April or, or May, like May 22nd is like, okay, you can go out and you can start fishing and, yeah. you know, uh, targeting these species. They have, they have keeps and, you know, where mm -hmm. you can, you can retain fish, but for the most part, most of us that go after the bigger fish, we're, we're, we just go out and play, you know, we have fun. And it's like, I'll throw the fly rod in went on the way down to the coast and I'll stop in at this river and I'll go run some nymphs through here and some dries. And I know that there's going to be a cutty sitting in there that's going to play or maybe a rainbow or something like that. And it, it's just kind of fun to go play with. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's usually seems like everything really starts to pop in April that's when like, it's like, Hey, I don't suck at fishing anymore. I'm like <laughs> catching fish. And then, and then by May it's in the full swing and everything's going really good. Yeah. And I noticed, I mean, the bluegill are kind of right around that same time when things start warming up, but usually you can get bluegill a little bit earlier mm -hmm. on some of the ponds here. And then that's also just kind of like a nice, um, a warm up round. <laughs> yeah, man, I can't say enough about bluegill and panfish. They are, yeah. <laughs> uh, they're, they're just so much fun and they have to be fun on, on the Tenkara. Do you target the panfish quite a bit? Um, not very often. Um, I've caught bass and, you know, bluegill are definitely fun. It's kind of like a nice, um, if you want to mix it up or also, um, you know, if somebody's learning, that's a great way to start it off. Um, yeah. Our dog doesn't really like fishing that much, but there is a local pond where she likes to go and sniff around. So sometimes that's kind of the, the trade-off is we'll take her there and she can go kind of run around, do her thing and rub in whatever she finds. Um, <laughs> and then we just usually go for a few bluegill and then go home for dinner. Uh, what kind of dog you got? Uh, she's just a little mutt. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we just adopted her from the local town, so... So she goes out and you guys go fish and, and she gets to go and find something to roll in. She'll yeah. go roll in it and then you guys head home, give her a bath. and Every time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Those um, dogs. Yeah. But I, I didn't know if she like sat there intently like watching for fish, you know, like, oh, I'm going to get this fish or, you know. No, she's not very interested. It's kind of funny. Um, my brother-in-law's dog like goes crazy as soon as you start casting, but. I've tried to show our dog, like when we catch a fish, try to show her the trout or the bluegill. She doesn't care. <laughs> just kind of like, oh, whatever. Oh, if it was I a treat, she'd be all over it. Oh yeah. Well, you say, hey, I got a treat. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can call her over. You know, and that, that then that turns into a problem. Every time I take my dogs fishing, I got two German short-haired pointers. They're in the <laughs> water, like chasing. I, uh, uh, my daughter and I, we went we went bass fishing on this river over in uh, Eastern Oregon, and we were fishing over there. I hook one. I'm like, fish on both dogs charging through the water. <laughs> they they kind of look, you know, when you watch the bears on the Kenai go after the salmon, yeah. they're like charging and, and it, and it intensifies the fight 10 times. Cause this fish is like, I got something in my mouth and I got something <laughs> big chasing me. And they're like running around and their eyes are like huge. And I'm like, Whoa, what is going on here? Yeah. It, uh, so it's always fun though, to have a dog out fishing. And take yeah. She definitely, uh, she definitely gets bored too. So she lets us know when it's time to go home or when it's dinner time. So, oh yeah. Yeah. Food, food and bed. That's, yeah. that's the, you know, I want, I want, I want to play. I want to have food and I want to go to bed. That's like, that, that's what makes dogs so awesome. They're, they're better than children, human children. <laughs> I, and I don't care if my kids listen to this. So, you know, our dogs are better than them, you know, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, so you have a lot of fishing opportunity in your local area uh, for you to be able to go out and pursue uh, fish. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a lot of small creeks just kind of like littered throughout the foothills here. Um, we do have a pretty big river, which, um, you know, like, I don't mean to get too sidetracked, but I'm trying not to name any 
That's okay. Kind Don't of like name the important any. bodies of water. Um, we have a beautiful area, and there is a really popular river in our area. But unfortunately, a lot of people have started coming here, and they leave so much stuff at the river, and it's kind of disheartening. And it's it's a bummer. I mean, even like where I went and took the Kru rod last time, I found a chair like out in the you know like a camping chair. Oh wow. Um probably like a mile up just on some random beach so I'm assuming somebody hiked out there with it you know climbed all the rocks and everything and then it's just sitting there and they didn't want to get it back um and I wanted to get it but the river wasn't really uh I wasn't about to you know risk it crossing the river just to bring back a chair um but I did carry a wet towel out of the canyon which was a uh, quite an exercise yeah, you know, that, that's one of those things. It's like, it blows your mind because we have all these beautiful areas all over, you know, that we all get to fish. And um, we have a lot of friends that really take the, this is a serious issue, pollution. You know, yeah. there's, there's certain pollutions we can't do anything about. Like, yeah, we're not, we're not going to take cars off the road. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. we, your state, my state, they, they're banning all gas powered vehicles by 2035. I don't know how well that's going to go, but it's still not going to remove gas powered vehicles. And they've been doing studies on Puget Sound salmon where they, they find the chemicals out of tires. Mm -hmm. It's a, a specific compound gets into these fish when they're going into natal creeks and, and it's killing the fish before they can spawn. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know where we're going to find an alternative to, to the, the synthetic rubbers we use in tires that's coming off tires. It could come off a bicycle tire. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, but there's things that we can do pollution wise to prevent that. One of those things is really picking up your own trash and, and doing that. And, you know, good for you for picking that up. That's, that's a huge, and, and, in those, you know, remote wild areas, that's quite the haul out. That's a yeah. lot to carry. Um, do they, are there organizations uh, in your area that actually go out and do like river cleanups or like groups of people? Um, there are, so some of the rivers do have kind of their own dedicated, um, cleanup crews and organizations. Um, I don't know as far as like the one that I was at in the Canyon, but, um, it is a state park. So, I mean, I guess that doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I just imagine somebody does a little bit of something, but I don't know. Well, yeah, you have to buy a state park pass, right? Um, not for all the state parks. Uh, some of them you do have to pay to park there, but they're usually not like gated or anything necessarily. It's just kind of patrolled by the rangers or whoever does it. And, um, they're not very active though, not yeah. in the last couple of years. So that's also kind of probably part of the issue with the pollution and, you know, people leaving all their stuff out there and, but um, as to the question you had asked earlier, though, I mean, where we're at in the foothills, we have pretty good access to just a ton of different rivers, too. I mean, quite a few good um, one people would call Blue Ribbon. I don't know if the other one is that I'm thinking of, but I I've, I've seen some big fish pulled out of that river, mm -hmm. um, you know, plenty of mountainous areas, too. Uh, probably about like a half day drive out to the eastern Sierras I guess depending where you want to go and then there's plenty more fishing there so yeah oh that's that's cool I I you know it's always nice when as anglers we have ample access to the waters that we really mm -hmm. like to fish and uh having having that ability to to you know whether it's a five minute drive away just to wet a line or it's a you know hour drive to like some pretty epic fishing it's yeah. always nice to have so that's cool i mean thanks thanks for sharing that because you don't have to name a river on here because we really do we do have a lot more folks getting into fishing and part of that is the adventure of finding where to go fish i like mm -hmm. yeah we can talk about the columbia river all day have fun <laughs> go out there there's plenty of room for you you can go out yeah. there you do whatever you want or you take uh you know like i said the trinity river or you take uh um the klamath or you take uh you know and it's pick one you know mm -hmm. the american river or whatever uh go 
find one of those rivers, they're huge. They get a lot of fish, but there's ways to fish them. We're not going to tell you like, oh, hey, go stand here and do that. But, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of other smaller places. Go just explore. Don't just go try to catch the fish. Go explore and see some of these places because you just never know. Yeah. You know, if you, if you come across something, go check the regulations, make sure it's open for fishing and go wet a line. You might be surprised at what you find. There's, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of them that, like I said earlier, I mean, places where, like, I probably wouldn't have been there if I wasn't looking for a fish. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's the whole thing. I mean, I, and that's what I've noticed, too, myself, is, uh, um, you know, the, the I've, I've picked, like, some of the most bizarre places to go fish. Yeah. And, and, then, and I end up throwing a line out and I'm like, whoa, there's a bunch of fish here. Yeah. <laughs> and I then I pick say, other places and it's like, there's nothing. But I had fun getting there. And that's what I was going to say too, is like, even with them car, there's been spots where I've gone and there's tiny little creeks. And I'm like, I don't know if there's really anything here. And, you know, if you cast in and you're like, oh, got a little rainbow or got a tiny little brown, or if you're lucky, you know, like a brook trout or something. Mm-hmm. So and that was kind of one of the things I got me into it as well as when a friend had let me borrow the rod, I was just like playing around and surprised by where I could catch fish. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> so that portability of the Tankara and the versatility of that type of fly fishing has mm-hmm. that lent, lent itself to you finding more places to fish just by using that method. Oh, definitely. Um, so that was actually kind of, I had seen Tenkara in the past, um, you know, before I really got into it and just kind of was like, I'm not really looking to fly fish. Um, growing up, I always use like a spinning rod and just kind of conventional tackle. We'd go for bass and everything. Um, and there was kind of a period of time where I wasn't really into fishing. So um, most of the rods and stuff were my parents' rods anyway. And then I was like, ah, I'm kind of enjoying spending more time outside. I'm going to get back into fishing, Um, bought a spinning rod and everything. But kind of my goal was to hike to different places and doing so, I, um, I kind of found I didn't like carrying all the, all the worms and weights and everything around. And then um, there was one time where we were at a lake and there was a bunch of fish rising, but they wouldn't go for anything I had. So it was kind of like that um, moment where I'm kind of thinking about it. I'm like, they're probably just going after bugs. And so then I was like, maybe I should check out fly fishing, see what it's all about. Did some research. I was kind of into the idea, but, you know, one of the big things was just kind of the... um, like seeing all the stuff of match the hatch and you have to have, you know, a five weight and a three weight and a, if you want to go for bigger fish, you got to buy this rod and all that stuff. And so it was kind of like, it's a little daunting and I wasn't really excited about trying to learn all that. And then kind of stumbled upon Tenkara again, asked one of my friends who I knew had had a rod because I was like, you know, it collapses small, it could fit in my backpack, just take a just take one fly box and call it good. Mm -hmm. Um, So he lent me a rod with a couple flies. Like I said, found some fish in some spots around town that I was like, wouldn't have guessed. Yeah. Um, And from there, it's just kind of been history. I've only used my spinning. Actually, I don't know if I've used my spinning rod. I've used somebody else's. (laughs) (laughs) Yours is collecting Um, dust. Yeah, pretty much. Um, But that it's kind of been a catalyst in a way to a lot more adventures in the sense that like, you know, it's something that I can put in the pack. I can go on a hike either by myself or it's not very hard to convince my wife to go either. Um, But yeah, just kind of, you know, depending what I want to do, how far I want to drive or how far I want to walk. It's been nice because yeah, the collapsing rod, the portability you don't have to bring much gear either like i said just the one fly box will do it usually especially like when you get to those higher alpine streams and stuff the fish don't care what you throw they'll eat it yeah well they're not pressured there no. it, it takes too much effort to get up there you yeah. gotta walk. <laughs> you can't pull up in the parking lot walk out to the dock and just flip you know worms out or power bait and then 
you know, sit there all day and, you know, yeah. it's been fished out or whatever. These, <laughs> these, these streams that hold these fish, when you're talking Alpine, they take, they take some considerable effort to get to, but the, and, and the fish aren't massive, but they're beautiful and they fight and they're aggressive. They have all yeah. that wild instinct. And I would say too, in the streams in the alpine areas i don't know if i've ever really come across another person another angler um definitely at the lakes i've seen plenty of people fishing but those those streams are overlooked you yeah know, especially because they're not very big and i don't think a lot of people really either they don't expect there's going to be a fish there or they're kind of going for you know a lake trout something big that's worth their while and their opinion Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, I, I have a question for you for a lake dwelling species, and it's on your profile. You can elaborate on this however much you want, but um, you have kokanee listed. <laughs> we, yeah. Um, so that one, the kokanee I caught this year was something that's been kind of like on my list for a while. Mm -hmm. I spent um, probably the first few years I fished with a 10 car rod searching for them on a particular river that I'd heard have them because I know the lake that it feeds has them. Mm -hmm. um, but I was never able to find them. And then I switched it up this year and went to a higher elevation and found them. Um, and I don't, it's kind of a weird thing. I will admit, I, I feel like I probably won't go back for them. I say that now I might change my mind next fall. Um, I was very cautious not to target any of them that were actively spawning. Mm -hmm. I went as close to the lake as I could and looked for ones that were still making their way up. Sure. Um, yeah, just because I do think it's important, you know, we want them to stay around and have opportunities for other people to catch them as well as, you know, the environment and everything. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, when when I saw that, I was like, "This had to be feeding a lake," yeah, and it had to be uh, because my experience with kokanee fishing, and you guys have great kokanee fisheries there. We have great kokanee fisheries. It's in a boat, yeah, with dodgers, wedding rings, and fire corn, and I don't, I don't even know. In, in some lakes, we're trolling sixty to eighty feet deep. So yeah. it, I don't, I don't even know. Like when I saw that, I was like, there's only one way he got this on the fly rod <laughs> and, and on tank car. I was like, there, there, there's no freaking possible way he was out there and he got like 90 feet of furled line. And it was like <laughs> the heaviest sink tip he could get to get this fish. But I was like, that is, you know, if you got that in the lake, uh, I would have been like, I don't know what you were thinking when you were doing that and what that rod looked like when you were burning that gear through the water. But man, that had to be something else. That's like well, a next level genius type move or something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I've only been kokanee fishing one other time with my dad and we didn't catch anything. They're 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 a goofy <laughs> fish, man. Yeah. <laughs> They're, they're goofy. I, some days I, uh, good, a uh, good friend of mine, I'm his client, you know, he, he guides kokanee on one of our reservoirs here and, uh, and he puts up these pictures, 40, 50 kokanee, right. And, yeah. and when you go kokanee fishing, that's not too uncommon, but I, I'm like, yeah, I don't have a downrigger. It's like, Oh, you don't need a downrigger right now. They're, they're 10 to 15 feet under the surface. You just go plow over them with them, you know, a, a dodger and, and wedding rings and all that mm -hmm. and they hit. He's like, we're getting big trout too. I was like, yeah, I saw that in the picture, you know? <laughs> um, so, so don't, don't make any mistake. You're, you're going to pick up trout. But I was like, how did he do this with a tank car rod? <laughs> uh, just knowing what it is, you know, it's just yeah. massive gear. No. And it was, it was difficult to get, to get them interested in anything else throwing in the water. I, you know, I was able to find some and I kind of like observing them for a while, just seeing what they're doing again, kind of making sure they're not actively spawning. Um, yeah. And yeah, started with like a, started with an egg pattern. Um, they didn't care about that. Did like a small kind of like leech pattern. They didn't care about that either. Switched to something with red. Fucking 
no mine. And then finally, it was um, actually just a, just a little Kabari that did it. Yeah. Yeah, I found a, like a small group of them and floated it through a few times. And I think on like the third or fourth time, I saw one kind of dart out and snatch it I, up. And then, yeah, it was game on. They're, they're funny fish. Uh, I, now, I know that we have our, our high lakes and stuff. And mm -hmm. I, I've heard of people when they do go fish them when they're spawning. Like they'll go look for them and they basically rig up just like they do for sockeye in Alaska with mm -hmm. a flossing rig and they'll, and they'll go floss them with a fly rod. And I, I don't find to, to each their own. If, if it's legal, you can do that for myself personally. They're such a small fish and, and I'm not going to keep any of them. I would rather not just, I, I, I don't personally, I don't want to risk foul hooking one by mm -hmm. swinging, a, a, you know, like a, like a, y2k egg through them and, yeah. and with some weight or something i just uh, you know i i if i'm gonna go after kokanee i'm gonna get out the conventional gear i'm gonna go troll them in the lake i want bright dime bright kokanee that i can go take back i can clean them we can mm -hmm. you know grill them on the barbecue they're they're awesome table fare um but when they're spawning it's like uh, yeah it, you know but i can i can also see what's cool about catching like a 17 to 18 inch kokanee this little miniature landlocked sockeye, you know, yeah. it's got, you know, a little buck, you know, with the green head and a red body, they're beautiful fish in spawn. Yeah. And when, when they spawn up a Creek, it's just like this, they're choked with red little green heads or they're fighting over reds. It's, it's like watching Alaska in miniature. It's super cool. Yeah. No, I'm, I was excited to do it. And, you know, another big thing too, was not wanting to foul hook it. So even better when I like saw the inside of its mouth and, saw it grab the fly and everything and I did put it back just because I felt that was the right thing to do mm -hmm. you know I realized like the mortality rate could have gone up quite a bit but I guess I was just hoping that that one would find its way back to what it was doing and there will be more next year no oh, absolutely you know it, it, there's always an inherent risk you know uh fishing is a contact sport yeah. Uh, whether, whether you have the best intentions, best fish handling, it's a contact sport. We can't always guarantee that the fish isn't going to swallow the hook. We do the best we can mm -hmm. to, to understand the fish that we're, we're fishing for use appropriate sized hooks and all that, but it's a contact sport. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not out there saying, well, you know, yeah, every fish you hook all this other stuff you're, you know, yeah, it, it, it may go die, you know, like a 50, 50, yeah. I don't, I don't believe that there's certain people that do, but uh, I, I see lots of fish just blast off across the rocks and take off and they're hauling back out in the current and they go back out there and they settle into what they were doing. They're like, Oh, I got to go reproduce, you yeah. know, <laughs> no, that's their thing. Or I got to go eat more bugs or whatever. I just don't want the one with the metal pointy thing on the end of it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not again. Um, um, yeah. And you know, I, I do my part too, where I can barbless hooks, rubberized nets if I can, or just, uh, um, I don't know the right term, but not the knotted nylon material, more of a mesh kind of deal. Um, try to keep them in the water, you know, check the temperature in the summers. So, because I do think yeah. it's important. And especially if, I mean, I don't really catch anything I keep. I mean, sorry, keep anything I catch. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, it goes back. Fish. Yeah, it goes back to that common sense fish handling. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know. I, I just got pictures from my friend right now of uh, 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 one of his uh, friends. He got this beautiful wild steelhead. It, hands are bare. It's cold out. Yeah. He's holding. He's holding up this beautiful. Uh, let's see. What is it? It looks. It's a buck. You know, probably about a seven pound buck steelhead. Um, mm -hmm. Has long tail, sea lice, clear fins. Just came out and. He's holding it up. He's got his picture. The net's down here. So they grab it, grip and grin, and, and yeah. it went off and it's on its merry way. Um, you know, that's the kind of stuff, you know, if, if you have somebody else there, take a picture, you know, everybody's ready. It's like, boom, out of the water, back in, see you later, dude. And, and we're all happy and merry and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, the net's a big thing too, when you're going to take pictures of your catches, because especially when you're by yourself. <laughs> yeah well and and that's one thing that we see a lot of uh in our in our social media community uh, uh, is that you have a lot of folks they 
we all want to take pictures of our fish. And so you got to get out your phone or your camera and you got to say, all right, I'm going to pick up the fish three, two, one snap fish goes away, all that <laughs> kind of stuff. And that's, that's how it's all taken care of and handled, but there's, there's a time delay in there. Uh, a lot of people don't give certain fish, res, you know, credit for the resiliency they have also, mm -hmm. but you know, we, their resiliency is there because they have to fend off predators and hide and all that kind of thing. Not so that we can just get pictures of them and like, Oh, wait a minute, my phone won't unlock, you know, and you got this fish. It's like, <clears throat> you know, it's yeah. like gasping for <laughs> breath, you know? So yeah, I, I, I prefer to just leave the fish in the net and, and, uh, you know, it, it, I don't have to grab them and hold them. I'll take a picture and leave it in the net and just let it go. You know, it's like, yeah, I had fun. Well, what, what, what was the fun I was looking for? Hooking it and fighting it. Once it's in the net, it's like, it's done, you know, yeah. nice trout, nice bass, nice, you know, whatever. Then we move on. I've heard um, too, somebody brought up a point um, and I thought it was pretty interesting. It was about fish mortality and also kind of the resilience mm -hmm. and kind of the idea that, um, you know, natural selection takes its course and the ones that don't survive, those genetics just fall out of the gene pool, you know, and then the ones that do, who have been hooked several times and who continue to survive, arguably breed like stronger, more resilient fish, mm -hmm. which, you know, something that I'd never kind of quite considered, but it makes perfect sense. And I'm not saying, you know, kill the weak ones by any means or yeah. <laughs> like still practice good fish handling skills but right you know I, I i can see that you know i i yeah. i i can subscribe to that 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 uh, uh school of thought mm -hmm. but and i've had plenty of bad experiences too i mean there was one time where i think it was the first fish i caught swallowed the hook it took me a while to get it out it wasn't doing so well so i kind of sat there for it felt like a really long time, but trying to revive the fish and it finally ended up swimming away, but I don't really know if it did any, you know, like how long it made it after that. And then after that, I was just kind of like, I don't really feel like fishing anymore. It's, it bummed me out. So I packed it up and went home. So my entire like 30, 40 minute session was spent with one fish. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's, you, you made the best effort possible to, yeah. to get that fish back out there in the water. And, and that's what counts is that we make the best effort possible. Cause I I've seen, I've seen so many people uh, where, where they catch fish and then it gets dropped on rocks. Of course it stuns it at that yeah. point. They're not dead, but it's not like a direct, you know, bonking the fish to kill it, but it does stun the fish. And then they just throw them back out and they float upside down and here comes seagulls or whatever, yeah. you know? especially like offshore fishing and all that, you, you, you run into that a lot. So. Yeah. And I mean, another thing too, that I've wondered about is you see all these pictures now, you know, with it being winter and pretty cold out in most places, um, people get their fish and they, you know, hold it out of the water to take their picture. And you see like, I don't know if they maybe dropped it in the snow, if the net had ice on it or whatever, but they got little bits of ice on them. Mm -hmm. and I always wondered, you know, is that really... I mean, if you're keeping it, whatever, but is that good for the fish? Is that something that harms it in the end? Well, if somebody's listening to this and they have some kind of, you know, actual data, not personal opinion, <laughs> I want actual data, shoot that email over, please. Because I, I, I can't honestly answer that. I, I, I fished in, fro you know, really icy mm -hmm. conditions and, you know, it, it seems to me like anything in contact with the water, as long as the water's running is thawed. Yeah. Um, but I've never, I've never personally pulled a fish up into snow per se, like on the bank. Yeah. Um, uh, it's been around when I fished, but I've never pulled a fish up into the snow and had it sugar cookie itself. Basically I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've never done that personally, but I do see a lot of folks like, um, you know, folks that fish the Midwest, they'll, they'll go out and they'll go for perch and walleye and pike and all that but they're keeping those fish, you yeah. know, if, if they're, if they're bait fishing with a, a tip up, they're going home, they're going to pickle the pike, they're going to fry the perch, you know, that, yeah. that's dinner. So it's like, eh, it's just like throwing it in the cooler. Right. Um, but, but the folks that do the catch and release, I don't know if that like has an effect on de-sliming. So if there's somebody out there that knows that uh, drop a comment in the YouTube or shoot us a uh, email, it, it would be good for both of us to know, because uh, I'll, I'll fully admit I am not, <laughs> educated not whatsoever and 
you're in sunny California, right? Well, when, when it decides to be sunny. So uh, it's a little <laughs> bit out of our, out of our experience range. And I imagine when they go back in the water, the ice thaws and melts and, you know, just becomes water again, but I don't know. Yeah. I, I guess I would equate it to us being wet and then, you know, like licking a light pole, it sucks, but I mean, yeah. eventually it'll get off, but <laughs> it's not like rolling our whole body, like taking us out of 40 degree water and mulling us through 30 degree snow or yeah. ice or whatever else. I, I think that can have a detrimental impact Yeah, in, in but, certain circumstances. Yeah. I'd be interested to find out. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know what this we've, we've, chopped an hour here already just like unbelievable <laughs> uh just about but um before we before we do the whole wrap-up thing and everything else what do you got planned for this year um last year i spent a lot of time kind of exploring different like presentations and stuff with the 10 car rod you know ways to i guess present the fly get a fish to take it um and that was cool i definitely learned a lot but doing that much technical writing and like trying to get content for all that is definitely a, um, it was quite a task. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, this year, I think I'm kind of just trying to take a step back, um, kind of do just more like sharing experiences and stuff. Um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get maybe like a little GoPro or something coming up here so that you know, I can start doing maybe a little bit more like video content. I don't know if I'll venture into YouTube or not, but um, I guess just more documenting kind of my time on the water and experiences that I have fishing. So um, other than that, you know, hopefully I can get in a few trips to some fun places, do some fishing in some different areas, but that's about it. Now, now, are you still doing uh, your blogging for like Tenkara USA and all that? Um, I don't have anything in the works right now, but I guess, you know, it kind of just depends. Um, I do have to talk to them a little bit more and see if they're looking for anything. Um, but I would like to continue that. Yeah, I guess I was going to say that, um, you know, a lot of podcast listeners also are into reading. Uh, mm -hmm. we, I, I like to say that our listeners and, and the viewers on YouTube, uh, we, we really encompass some, some fantastic thinkers and people that are, are, are generally uh, wanting, wanting to learn more. And mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, you, you do blog for Tankara USA. It's not all the time. Obviously, you got to have fish. You can't have yeah. atmospheric river <laughs> gushing down on you. Work gets in the way, too, and everything else. You know, I mean, we all, we all have that stuff that, that, that can hinder that, that production of, of that type of content. But I think it's cool that you're going to get a GoPro because um, you, you do have some beautiful country. It's just even if there's no fish, it's, it's just so cool because, you know, you kind of imagine, oh, I'm going to, you know, you know, be out there in the redwoods or, or up in the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Ponderosas and, you know, the, the granite of the Sierras and everything else. That's just, it, it's cool. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, I guess so ultimately that's kind of what I'm trying to do with like, you know, doing a little bit more photography, um, kind of trying to capture more of like the atmosphere, trying to be able to kind of like convey the experience that I had, um, you know, whether it's like the scenery, the fish, the water, just trying to be able to write about those things a little bit more. So yeah, for sure. Rather than such technical, like you cast it this way and then you have to pull the fly this way. And, you know, it just, it's time consuming and it was fun, but I'd, I'd rather kind of share a little bit more pictures of fish than flies. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, and I think that, that a lot of blog writers have that ability to transition from being somebody that's writing like a technical report. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and when we read about like, this is how you rig X, Y, Z we're reading a technical report, but I think a lot of us like to hear some of the stories of like, you know, I was at X river this day and it was sunny. It was bright and it was beautiful. And I, you know, used this rig the first time and I was just absolutely amazed. And then it goes into the technical part, you know, or, yeah. you know, just even at that, like sharing the stories of like, you know, I have my adopted mutt dog and we like to go hang out at the park <laughs> pond and catch bluegill. I think that those are just fantastic because it's like, yeah, you know what? That sounds good. 
that yeah. article comes out and it's inspiring. You know, that, mm -hmm. that story comes out and it's inspiring for a lot of folks. It's like, <sighs> maybe, uh, maybe it's time for me to go down and actually put in a little effort at the local pond and, and see if I can't go get a fish, you know, yeah. no matter how you fish, right? It's just all about getting out there. It's all about how many bluegill you can catch. Exactly. It's a, it, <laughs> that's a numbers game there because because when everything else sucks, you know that you can always get bluegill. If I don't leave the park pond with 10 bluegill, I'm like, I'm really having a bad day of fishing. <laughs> it's a numbers game. That that's the only fish I somebody needs to come up with a bluegill tournament. You no, know, like like biggest bluegill, most bluegill, like the craziest like bluegill take on the dry or whatever else. Like <laughs> fly fishing bluegill tournament you know everybody buys in five bucks pot and and you throw in like some little you know grubs and strike king you know just goofy little flies and all that kinds of stuff you know and, mm -hmm. and just go try it you know why not you yeah. know let's do a bluegill <laughs> tournament everybody does a bass tournament or you know a salmon derby or a steelhead tournament or whatever let's do a bluegill tournament <laughs> why not everybody gets involved five bucks buy in the most fish wins the pot and then we have a bunch of prizes i support it I, I think that would be awesome, man. Uh, Martin, thank you so much for being on here. Where can people find you at? Um, most, I spend most of my time on Instagram. So, um, say chart 10 car is my handle there. Um, it's actually my handle across the board. So I do a little bit on TikTok, but I'm not very active there. Um, and I have a YouTube account. I don't have anything on there, but who knows, maybe coming up this year, I'll be able to put some videos up there. Awesome. And what we'll do is we'll link all of your stuff in the YouTube video so people can jump over there, check out your stuff. Maybe when you're watching this on YouTube, folks, hit that subscribe button for Martin and, and give him some inspiration. Like, hey, there's actually some folks out there that want to watch what he's got going on. So uh, yes. I get, I, but I guarantee the Instagram, very cool, very entertaining, a lot of great stuff on there too. Oh, thank you. So, well, Martin, there again, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to talk to you tonight and uh, have you share your stories and everything that you're doing. Oh, man, I'm honored. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, folks, make sure to go check out Martin and uh, go over to Sage Heart Tenkara on Instagram. All of that's going to be in the show notes down below for YouTube here. Or if you're listening on Spotify, just make sure you type in at Sage Heart Tenkara. You can find Martin over there. Now, for everybody else, you want to get a hold of us, you can get a hold of us through our email at workingclassfish at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram at Working Class Fishing. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube under Working Class Fishing Podcast. Make sure that you check us out on all of these different platforms. Uh, and we are on pretty much every major listening platform. So if you're listening to this, you found us and you know where we're at. But if this is your first time and let's say you want to run Apple or Google, we're on those platforms. But this episode has been brought to you by Anatomist Flyco, CD Fishing USA, Mr. Sure Cure Not a Tackle, Angry Rooster Fly Company, 317 Flies, and Lid Rig. Make sure to go check out all those sponsors. They're fantastic folks and they have great products. And be sure to tell them that we sent you. But until next time, everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope everybody has a wonderful day.